Welcome back. So the title of this mini lecture is Slave Resistance, and we're going to talk about five things that as you read more about the institution of slavery and about enslaved people uh, and about the experiences that they endured, uh, that this will help you to kind of get a sense of things. All right. So slave resistance is a, a, a difficult topic. Uh, but let's let's dig into this. So the the first thing to know about would be myths and race. So the history of enslavement and the institution of slavery uh, for many years in the 19th century and the early 20th century was often and far too often uh, written by white individuals who largely held views on race that many other white individuals held in the late. 19th and in the early 20th century, uh, in which we would, of course, today uh, look at those views to be profoundly, profoundly biased, profoundly racist, uh, and we're really reflecting the lost cause and, and proto sort of Confederate ideology. So I'm thinking specifically of Ulrich Phillips, perhaps one of the more well-regarded white historians of the early 20th century, who wrote a book about American slavery, where he functionally said that slavery was good for those who were enslaved, which, of course, is completely not true and is really racist and awful. Uh, but it was taken as normalized historical scholarship amongst much of the academic community uh, in the early 20th century. Of course, the f individuals like, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois would have you know, a few things to say about that, but, you know, hey, uh, this is what existed. Uh, so, as a result, analysis about slave resistance uh, reflected the fact that those who tended to study much of this uh, were profoundly sort of racialized in their gatekeeping of understanding uh, what the institution of slavery was. Uh, so the view of many of these white historians often was that, well, you know, uh, you don't actually have a lot of resistance and there's not a lot of violent uprisings, so obviously they must love, you know, they must love slavery, which again reflects only the racialized and, and, and racist and biased notions of those, uh, those individuals. So that brings us to our second uh, term or second thing, uh, which would be silent sabotage. Slaves fought back, often and always. They made choices to attempt to carve out lives and to do so with what dignity they could without being killed or seeing those around them brutalized or they themselves brutalized. Violent uprisings occurred, but they were far less common due to any number of factors Often, of course, the idea of being caught and killed being the result. Silent sabotage was by far the most common form of resistance that enslaved people had against their enslavers and the broader white community. The act of, of private resistance, of breaking a tool, of slowing the pace of work, of transforming work dynamics in, in intimate settings to attempt to achieve a measure of agency. Now, much of the work on silent sabotage uh, has been done since the 1950s, 1960s, as understandings of race have changed in the part of, of, of many. Uh, and it has given scholars particularly uh, those of, of race and, and slavery an opportunity to be able to look at those sources a little bit better. Uh, you know, for example, you know, let's say a plantation record has uh, a process of, you know, tools getting broken or something, you know, whatever. You know, a, a white scholar writing in the early 1900s might look at that and say, well, you know, that enslaved person, uh, because of who they are and the nature of race, isn't very smart, and so the tool gets broken, right? A, a scholar in the 1950s, early 1960s, moving forward, is able to look at that and say, no, uh, that would be a racist way of thinking it. Uh, you know, we need to more so look at this as, as slaves fighting back uh, in their own way uh, as best they could. So there are many forms 
of, of resistance. There are private ones. There are small versions of collective ones. Uh, but slaves daily had to lead, right? Enslaved people daily had to lead uh, and embody multiple identities, both uh, to fellow enslaved people, to whites, and to themselves. The next would be Denmark Vesey. So in talking about enslavement and resistance, keep in mind there are many active attempts at violent resistance and violent uprisings, and largely they fail in the U.S., now, some might say because uh, some white individuals were killed in some uprisings, this kind of thing, that, that that means they were successful. But we need to look at what the objectives of each rebellion was, you know, what, what they were, what the objectives were, uh, in order to really sort of define a measure of success, right? If the measure of success really is freedom for those who are leading in this rebellion, uh, then, of course, these are not successful. So Denmark Vesey would be an example of one of these particularly the first half of the 19th century. Uh, Denmark Vesey was born in the 1760s uh, around St. Thomas, makes his way eventually to Charleston, uh, was an enslaved individual of birth, and eventually becomes free, uh, gets actively involved in the AME church there, uh, and is part of, supposedly is part of leading uh, or planning something called the Rising, which was going to happen in 1822. Now, Eventually, Denmark Vesey is caught uh, and is, uh, you know, sort of tried and executed very quickly, uh, and uh, the the rebellion never really never really occurs. Uh, another example, another one for us would be that of Nat Turner. Uh, Nat Turner's rebellion, uh, what is also referred to as the Southampton Insurrection. Uh, so. In, in early 1831 in Virginia, uh, Turner was uh, the leader of a group of individuals uh, who felt that uh, the time was, was right to carry out uh, a violent uprising uh, in this part of Virginia. And so they begin the process of doing so. Uh, and a number of, of white individuals are, are killed uh, and militias are called in. Uh, and those who are with Turner are, are overwhelmed, uh, and many of them are killed, uh, and the rebellion is put down. Uh, Turner is caught, uh, eventually, and killed. Uh, and the, the rebellion was noted for sort of its indiscriminate violence, you know, supposedly against, against white people. Either way, when thinking about rebellions, you know, sort of it's important to sort of acknowledge what comes sort of after this, right? So, you know, for those who are attempting through violence to achieve freedom and they're going to fail, uh, the idea is that they represented to, to white individuals, they represented confirmation bias uh, on, on how the racialized thinking that they had towards individuals of African ancestry uh, who were enslaved. Uh, for those who were enslaved, right, they represented, um, you know, an attempt, uh, you know, a measurable attempt at, at freedom, which was denied. Uh, and, and only furthered, of course, the violence uh, by which the white community, the slave owning community, right, sought to maintain enslavement. Last point for us is the threat of sale. Uh, so the common or constant threat of being sold, of being separated, um, for, for some led to acts of resistance, led to acts of violence. Uh, and, and led to, uh, you know, these kinds of actions, right? It's that question of what brings on sort of slave resistance uh, and, and threat of sale, uh, particularly to the Deep South, uh, you know, was a common thing. All right. Thanks so much.